Hello CS27. In this video, I'm going to talk about Unit 8. Per special request, I'm releasing this module early. So this is part 1 of Unit 8 video. And in Unit 8, you are to read Chapter 8, look at the notes videos, complete your in-class assignment, and your lab. And in this week, it's very exciting because we're going to talk about penetration testing or pen tests. We're going to talk about risk assessment, vulnerability scanning, tools to assess security posture in the organization, and troubleshooting the common security issues, managing your risk. So if you notice in the module, you will find the notes. And under the notes, I include some publication under NIST. And NIST give us the guidelines on how to do risk assessment. So if you want to approach risk assessment, make sure that you review the guidelines. That's going to lay out the framework so that way you can start working on various areas, what you need to look for. It really identify the components of the risk assessment there. And if you wanted to look at the framework, you can also click that link. Here it shows you how to find the framework information. And this is available to you. So it's always good to refer to this framework and guidelines, especially for us who are operating for national organizations. Now, if you are working with international organization, you want to refer to ISO frameworks and be able to look at their documentation for international requirements. So in chapter eight, there's also notes. And in the later part, I'm gonna to touch on the, the difference between pen testing and ethical hacking. And I included one of my presentation to show you different areas of pen tests and EH or ethical hacking. And so if you want to view the presentation, you can look at it there. And I will post the lab and the lecture videos as follows. So right now what I will do is I will go over the notes and the assignment questions. And then in subsequent video, I will include the presentation and touch on tools and things that you can use. When you, if you're looking to pursue the area of pen test or EH. So to begin, we need to define risk management. What is a risk and how to manage it? So the security position that you're looking for in different areas of security position, you would see that risk management is a huge factor whether you wanted to look at application security or network security. Um, in general, we have to really address the risk. We can reduce the risk. We can implement solutions so that way we can mitigate some of the risk. So a risk is a likelihood that a threat will exploit the vulnerability. And for Security Plus, make sure that we understand what a risk is, right? So in the daily life, we have, we take risks like driving on a car, right? Walking on the street. And in the system, when we're using our computer system, we take a risk when we're accessing websites, when we're downloading a file. And so in a network environment, what we want to look at is, how we can evaluate specific risks and will that risk impact the operation of our organization. And you might have positive or negative risks. So potentially there's always a likelihood that some form of threat 
will impose an impact in your operation. Now, vulnerability is a weakness. In the last couple of weeks, we started talking about vulnerability with our software tools, our, app, our applications, our operating system. But vulnerability in general, it could be weakness in a system or a software. And no system or software is perfect. A threat is potential danger. And in the past, we talked about an attacker could be a threat, or you might have insider threat. Could be internal employee, managers, right? Or somebody externally infiltrating into your company pretend to be one of the person that would be trusted. So we touched on social engineering before. So a threat is just a potential danger. Now, the area that we want to focus in is going to be the impact, the magnitude that could harm or cause harm to your organization or could cause damage to your assets, your system, people, facility. So in threat assessment, what you need to look at is event or circumstances. So a lot of the times we would look at logs, event log that document a certain, could be abnormal or outstanding event or circumstance. And that event can compromise CIA, confidentiality, integrity, or availability. So in the area of threats, we need to take a look at potential threats in malicious human threats, attackers, script kitties, criminals, APTs, organized crime groups, disgruntled employee, accidental human threats caused by accidental events. Possibly an employee did not have the proper knowledge and they downloaded a file that impacted the system or the network because it contained malware. Sometime that they are careless and leaving the door open so that someone can enter the facility. We can have environmental threat, floods, earthquakes, storms, fire, etc. So threat assessment help us identify and categorize a threat. So when you identify the threat, you would put it on a list and you would rank it. So you can use a number system like zero through five, right? Five for critical, zero for low impact. And we would use that assessment to predict how that's gonna impact our, our organization or our assets. And so if you're taking that to a scale of a home use, you can do the same thing. You can take a look at your systems at home. You can look at the threats that your system might be exposing to. Okay. So in, in a threat assessment, we again look at the categories of our threats environmental threat it could be a man-made threat threat that would be created by humans malicious or accidental we can look at internal threat that's evaluating within the organization or external threat that's coming from outside of our organization so in the first question, it asks you to provide an example of malicious human threats. And you can say, you can list any of the types that's provided in the notes, or if you know it, you can list them. Script kitties, criminals, disgruntled employee, organized crime group, APTs, For question two, it asks you to provide an example of accidental human threats. 
things like they accidentally delete the file and those files contain critical organization information people payroll etc they actually disclose personal identifiable information on email messages or phone because they're not trained or they fall into social engineering tactics dispose documents that contain PII personal identifiable information improperly dispose I should say throwing it in the trash by accident not knowing that type of document contain valuable important information that should not be thrown away in the hole right that should be shredded and properly disposed leaving system login with essential files open and people do that if they are in a hurry or they're forgetful so they accidentally leave the system login someone could walk by delete their files or copy their files or send their files from that system so there could be many different accidental cases so in number two you can list a few or one For question three, it asks you, what are the differences between environmental and man-made threat assessment? Give an example. Environmental assessment evaluates the likelihood of natural or natural incidents. Man-made disaster would be man-made threat. So when we do an assessment, we evaluate the likelihood of either natural or man-made disaster could be occurring. So an example would be assess California fire in the region of the business operation. Man-made assessment evaluates the likelihood of human threats, accidental threat, or malicious threat. So malicious coming from malicious intentions, people that are angry, people that want to make a point, a political point, um, etc. Another example would be assessing attacker, the potential that an attacker would breach a network, right? How do we do that? We can evaluate it by using pen testing techniques we can see how easy it is for someone to enter our network and also how easy it is for someone to break passwords of our accounts or someone to be able to steal data from our servers so and with that assessment what you can do is you can look at the weak area and address those weak area like how to reconfigure the firewalls or how to block a certain type of traffic so that way we are not going to get denial of service etc for question four it asks you for two example of system vulnerability vulnerability is a weakness that exists in a system so if if we have the firewall but we don't configure it that's no good so that lack of firewall is a weakness lack of software updates is a weakness lack of operating system updates is a weakness okay using weak password is a weakness so you can look at various vulnerability and you can list them there going back to the notes on page one it talks about vulnerabilities it is a flaw or a weakness of a hardware or a software and often you would hear about internet of things things that you are connecting to the internet like your health bands Fitbits, 
or you have you know smart devices at home your google nest etc and those come with flaw designs so it's important for iot devices to have firmware updates to properly train the people who use that to use it securely and IoT devices can be used in hospitals, it can be used in industrial, it can be used in supply chain, so many different areas for IoT application. So we need to look at the lack of, of updates. We need to take a look at the, the flaw in design. For example, car has connectivity to the internet and so it's important that we update the computer in the car so that way it would have the proper security measure when it's connecting. We want to change the configuration from default so the if you leave the default configuration that would also impose vulnerability. Lack of malware protection lack of update definitions for your anti-malware, lack of firewalls, and lack of rules for your people and your system, organizational policies. So policies are rules that is stated on paper or documents, and those rules will be applied into the system. So for example, you would have to state password has to be complex it has to have certain amount of characters it would uh, not be reused five times so once those rules are written for the organization then it can also be configured in the security policy for our system now all of this is tied into risk management and risk management is a practice of identifying, making a list of your risks, monitoring, checking your against your risks, what's happening, and looking at your network, your system, and limiting risks into a manageable level. And keep in mind that you cannot remove most of the risk, but you will have to work with the risk and you can use tools, practices, training, and a lot of different areas in security to reduce it to an acceptable level. So the goal is to reduce our risk to the level that the organization can accept, right? And a lot of the times they will accept that. So for example, uh, Facebook was violated privacy rules and they had gone to court they paid fines because they had sold some of the user or most user information to a third party this was happening years back so what happened is they're aware of that they would weigh the risk right uh, will they if they accept it they might have to pay fines and possibly face charges or they can try to reduce that risk by protecting user privacy a little bit better so now because of the the lawsuit facebook now have to go back renew and re, re update their privacy protection for the user by mandatory requirement by regulations so the company can choose different technique to respond they can avoid the risk by not providing any service or participating into risk activity so for example if a person is they they don't want to get in a car accident they can avoid the risk of getting in a car accident by not driving at all. They can transfer the risk, and the risk can be transferred to a third party, right? Like 
they would outsource that to a company that will handle that part of the risk, like a cloud company. Or uh, in our case, in the case of driving, we can look at insurance as a transferable area of the risk, where in the case that someone gets in a car accident, the insurance company would handle fixing the car and help the person with the injury costs. We can mitigate the risk by implementing control to reduce risk. So most often you would see that for the IT and the security people, this is the area where we operate. We will implement control to reduce our risk. And so that way we would get it to a low enough level where we can accept it. And so when cost of control outweighs the risk, the organization will often accept the risk. In the case of Facebook, like I said earlier, they would weigh the cost. The cost of being fined in court and be charged with that particular violation or right to the cost of or the, the money that they gain from selling the privacy of their user. So here you would see the risk response technique on page one of our notes. So going back to our questions in our assignment, what is the primary role of a risk of risk management? Our primary goal is to reduce the risk to the level that the organization can accept. And when the organization cannot afford to implement the control of the risk, what type of risk response should the organization practice? In question six, they would accept that risk, like what we just touched on. So let's look through an example or an exercise for seven. You can identify your own assets and their value. So to really start with risk management, we first need to identify our assets. Assets could be a house, it could be a car, it could be a laptop, it could be people, it could be a building, something that we own or have some value. So I list here's a car and you can put dollars to it because we want to quantify our risk. So we first need to quantify our assets. Next, we would list the things that we own, like a laptop, $1,000, could be $5,000 laptop, people, right? And people would be a little harder to assess how much is that person going to cost, right? Or in a lot of the times, company would look at the person's worth to that organization. So with seven, you can list your own assets and their values. So before we get into number eight, let's take a look at the details for the notes. So in risk management, we would our risk assessment, we would have risk analysis where we quantify, where we put numbers to specific assets and risk level, or we qualify where we would rank it with low, medium, or high, right? So you can quantify, we can say 0, 3, 10 for different levels of your risk, or we can qualify but we can say low, medium, or high, or low, right? Low impact, medium impact, or critical impact. So qualification is really just, we would use a label to qualify that level. Or quantify, we would use numbers. So the first step in risk assessment is to identify assets and its values like what we did in question six of your assignment. It could be products, it could be system, it could be resources or process. 
and when we qualify, we would say low, medium, or high. When we quantify, we would put money values to it, monetary values, $20,000, $2 million, etc. For step two in risk assessment, we would assess risk based on current conditions, new, existing, like new systems, existing control, new services. So for new system, the value of that system is higher. And this is when you would include, you know, your business managers and your account payable people or accountant in your company to really help you put the dollars and cents to specific resources when you quantify your risk. And, your, and you would start with assets. So in quantitative risk assessment, we can put dollars to specific things. So here's the formula. When you're looking at a single loss expectancy, your SLE, that would be a cost of a single loss. For example, if a person, an employee, forgot the laptop, at Starbucks or a coffee shop, the cost of the laptop is going to be the cost of the single loss in that event. Or when you have malware that is downloaded by a user that destroy a thousand files, each file costs a hundred dollars to rebuild. So that will be $100,000 for that single loss. So the way we calculate this is an SLE is equal to ALE divided by ARO. And an ALE is an annual loss expectancy. How often is that? How many times in a year you would have that type of loss? And so for the annual rate of occurrence, how many times the loss in the, that would occur in a year? That's the ARO. The ALE is the annual loss expectancy. How much money you're going to lose based on the number of times that you are going to face a loss in that year. So using this formula, if we look at the example, let's say <clears throat> that if we have an incident per month, Somebody lose their smartphone each month. That means that we would have 12 occurrences. That will be 12 for ARO. So you would take that value and you would multiply it with the cost of that one incident. You would have the total for the annual loss expectancy. So when we do this calculation in our assignment for number eight, we have ABC Corp purchase 100 laptops for its marketing team. The value of the laptop is $1,500. The employees lose about six laptops a year. What is ABC annual loss expectancy? So your SLE is the price of the laptop. The single loss expectancy is $1,500. And it tells us that the employees lose six laptops a year. So your ARO is six. That means that to calculate the annual loss expectancy for the entire year, so each laptop costs us $1,500 or costs ABC $1,500. And they lose six in a year. So you simply take 1,500 times six, so ABC is expected to lose $9,000 each year on laptops. Okay. okay. 
so that will be the result from L. So here we can take a look at different things outside the laptop. So let's say if you're looking at uh, servers, right, or malware impacting, or um, you know employees accidentally deleting files and how many files that's happening each month and compare that to a year so and each file will cost us a certain amount of money so you can look at events or incidents and you can base the incidents that have been happening historical you know incidents and then look at the trend and the baseline and you can be able to assess and predict how much money the company is expected to lose. And that's part of quantifying your risk. So in the grand scheme of things, $9,000 might be a lot for a very small company, or it could be very little for a larger enterprise. Okay, however, we're not looking at the laptop from the lens of data that's contained on that laptop. So $1,500 is just a brand new laptop. Now when the data is stored on that laptop, then the value of that laptop is different. And if it's an older laptop, if this is happening further down the line, the laptop cost is depreciated, but then you have the value of the data right for the marketing team that they're going to lose and that will cost money because those files the data has to be rebuilt for example like customer list customer contact information and then it becomes a privacy issues when we have a leak of customer data like bank account information etc okay so the cost would be more than just a laptop when it start containing PII or essential data for operations. Then next we're going to talk about qualitative risk assessment. So in qualitative approach you would categorize the risk based on the likelihood of occurrence. So looking at the probability of the event that will occur. We're going to look at the impact level, how the magnitude of the harm resulting from the risk, and if you want to assign the number of the probability of the impact, then you can assign that. Okay. So now in quality, when we quali qualify the risk, for risk assessment, you just look at the likelihood of the occurrence or the probability of the event occurring. So we can say low, medium, or high, right? Low impact, medium impact, high impact, etc. And if you wanted to translate that into level, right? You can say one for low, three for medium, five for high. And then you can use the calculation to really compare or the number to compare across in a matrix. So when you read the documentation from this or the framework, you would see recommendation in a guideline from this to use metrics. And metrics basically is built from listing your risk and to be able to look at your assets, right, your risk, and then quantifying or qualifying your risk. So it's important that we document that, right? We don't just do it and not document it because in auditing for compliance, sometimes they require that you submit information for risk assessment. And we wanted to use that information to further improve our security landscape, our security posture. So you would write a report. And so when you perform risk assessment using pen testing techniques, you also need to put that the, re, the findings in your report at the end. 
otherwise it defeats the purpose. So the difference between a pen tester and an attacker is that the pen tester, right, tests given the permission of the organization and the pen tester tests within the boundary that's given by the organization and the pen tester documents at the end. So document assessment is important in this field. You also need to look at risk register. And risk register is a repository of all risks identified. It is a comprehensive document listing all the known risks, every piece of information about that risk. We would have category, type of risk, likelihood of occurrence, the level of impact, your score, right, based on our ranking scale, the type of control that would allow us to mitigate or reduce our risk, contingencies, score with control, action assigned, and action deadline. And this is a big area. So a lot of the times when you look at security, this is what we this is what we work toward. Right? All the things, the configuration that we do, the pen test that we attempt, the setup of our network um, with different appliances and so on, training our people is when it all comes down to it is to really reduce risk in our environment. So in this, it, for question nine, it asks you describe the process of risk assessment. We would need to identify the assets related to risk. Then we assess the level of risk for the assets. Next, we would provide control recommendations. What do we need to fix, right? And list the actions that to be taken and correlate the timeline in the documentation. So that would be the processes behind risk assessment. Now, when we evaluate vulnerability, what do we really look at? We look at logs. So log analysis is important. So if you are new or trying to learn log analysis, there are different tools like Splunk. There are different tools in Linux, like in Kali, there are some tools, but you can find open source or commercial tools for log analysis. Some company, they would acquire a commercial right tool so that way it will be well supported. Or in other cases, they would use open source tool to be able to implement for reading logs. Or they can create their own tools and you can write Python script to filter, search for looking at different types of logs. And logs can be exported out so you can have a dot log or a dot text, right? And in Windows system, a lot of the log entries would then be, you can export that out as CSV file or, and, and be able to convert that. You can convert that to text if needed. Sometimes you would have online logs using XML, right? Um, so with that, you know, you can read it in specific applications if needed. So look at policy and sin security logs, policies or rules that have been stated and configured. We can ask people by interviewing them because sometimes people would recognize certain risks or they are aware of certain assets that would be exposed to certain risks and vulnerabilities, and then you can test the systems. So to assess vulnerability, we need to look at these areas and more. Okay. So now 
here it talks about checking for vulnerabilities and right before that it talks about supply chain assessment and supply supply chain is all elements that's required to produce and sell all product okay so for example from the beginning to end like if you're looking at bottled water how is the bottle manufactured right then distributed to the water company the water company filter the water fill in the bottle package it then transport it to stores and then store would sell it so supply chain would look at from the beginning stage to the end all elements that were required for that product to be sold from producing to selling and supply chain assessment evaluate all elements from raw material to processes to creation design right and selling and distribution so all the stages for that product life mature supply chains entail multiple places to obtain raw material so if we're looking at raw material like plastic where is that coming from or toilet paper where is that coming from right pulps that used to make toilet paper plastic used to create bottles which is filled with water and become bottled water so and in order for that raw material to be matured it needs to have multiple places to obtain and most company will have that they might obtain from china or india or other areas of the world evaluate methods and improve so in supply chain assessment they would look at the processes the methods in each area and they need to be able to improve so to to really evaluate this right we have to look at it from a security lens methods that would pertain to our system because manufacturing would require uh, system control etc and right below this it talks about checking for vulnerability which goes back to the question we just answered okay and vulnerability assessment first you look at assets and the capability then you would prioritize the assets which one is very critical in the operation so if you're looking at a store like costco walmart the operation the important is to make sure that power is on and sales terminal is open and sales people customer service is available right those are the critical assets and for identify vulnerability to prioritize them so what would be the weakness in that type of operation and how to reduce that weakness then to reduce the weakness we would recommend control okay so for example if power there's power outage and and the whole building have no power then we would have a power generator if our sales terminal is down is there a backup system in place so in the way that we look at this is if we're looking at applications or systems we can look at how users are authenticating to those system or applications we can utilize tool like password cracker and as i noted in the lab any tools that you use on your system is okay because it's your system but when you try to operate those tools on other people's system you have to acquire permission and you should get a written permission because you don't want to circumvent certain system as it would violate community regulation 
So in the lab this week, you're going to look at password cracker. It could be offline or online to discover passwords using attacks like brute force or dictionary or rainbow. You can look at ways to scan. So in for pen testers, they would look at different areas like for cryptography, for passwords, for web applications, code evaluations, networks. So in a network environment, we can look, we can scan and gather the information about the host. And there are different types of scan. We can have a passive or in or non-passive scan and I touched on this a while back. So here's some information about scans, right? You can use Nmap or Zenmap. In the future lab we'll look at those. Uh, you can do stealth scan, you can look at OS detection, looking at your wireless connection. You can use vulnerability scanners. And vulnerability scanners are used to scan susceptible system to attacks, identify vulnerability, misconfigurations, test security controls, or lack of security control. You can look at Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer. That's one for Microsoft. You can use you can use Nessus, and Nessus, the commercial version of it, uh, the professional version is very expensive. But the home uh, version is free to use. We can use Zenmap or Nmap to look at ports, what's open, what's not. Or we can simply look at system configuration for ports, weak passwords, account, default accounts, data that's not controlled with permissions, especially sensitive data or misconfigurations or security configuration errors. This concludes my part one of the lecture and the assignment. Please watch part two for the rest of the questions, the second part of the lecture and the presentation. Thank you.